Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT show, The Nation Talks. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 exciting minutes. Guaranteed, as always. <laughs> you know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Uh, the Tories' UPIC has spoken. What is UPIC, you ask? Well, UPIC stands for the Union Policy Implementation Committee, which is headed up by Michael Gove. And it has told the world uh, uh, and the excited nation that uh, if all else fails, the UK government will agree to look again at devolution, but only in the context of UK-wide changes. There's only one problem, of course. Uh, as the Sunday Times has pointed out in a poll last week, very few people south of the border uh, have much interest in Scotland staying in the Union and almost no interest in constitutional change. So the notion that this government, of all governments, uh, is, is going to put this question uh, to the people south of the border, uh, borders are being fanciful, crazy. Thanks, us, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we have yet another great guest, uh, and tonight I'm really excited that he's able to join us. Uh, the TNT show welcomes Roger Mullen. Now, Roger has a stellar career uh, in supporting independence. He's also a successful businessman and a visiting professor at Stirling University. And he will be taking your questions live for the next 60 minutes. So, TNT, The Nation Talks, this is very much your show. Do give us your questions. Details are on the screen, or you can go to the What's On page for Indie Live. You'll find all the details there. Uh, if you want to contact me direct, I have my phone. You can contact me at john at cliche.com, and we'll look forward to receiving your questions. We've already had a number in advance, and thank you, folks, for those. So now to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks to Roger Mullen. Roger, how are you coping with the pandemic? I think, like everybody else, getting a bit fed up of it, but realising that hopefully we're getting into that straight where we can see a finish line in the distance. And if that's the case, I think we've all got to Kuridun for another few months and uh, hopefully things will improve. I was really pleased to have a look just a short time ago at the uh, vaccination figures in Scotland. And I think we are, despite what the media is saying, progressing very well. So. Good. Let's just keep going, folks. There is nothing else for it. Yeah, there you are. Be steadfast and stick at it. Yeah. It's going to be a long haul, I guess. Uh, yeah. Roger, tell us about Roger Mullen. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Right, well, I was born in the uh, little town of Mabel, the capital of Carrick in Ayrshire, mm -hmm. quite a few years ago. And uh, I grew up with my mum and dad. My mum and dad had a, a wee baker's business next to the town hall there. And uh, I had an older brother and an older sister who were very bright at school. And then along came me. And <laughs> <laughs> we, went, I, we all went to Carrick Academy in Mabel. And my brother, who sadly died a few years ago, but he was eight years older than me, was the first in the entire family ever to go into higher education when he went to Glasgow University, followed a few years later by my sister. I was the renegade in the family and went to Edinburgh University. So, <laughs> so my early days were in Mabel. Uh, I was probably a pretty terrible pupil at school until I found one thing I could do very well, and that was run pretty fast. So I won the Senior Sports Championship three years in a row. I won a Scottish Junior title for 440 yards. Yes, I'm so old, I used to run in yards. <laughs> People run in metres. So I was a typical uh, young boy. I enjoyed playing football for the school team. I took up and played golf. Got to the fourth round of the Scottish Boys Championship. Oh, yeah, was 16, and uh, uh, did athletics, ran for AFC Fourth Athletic Club, joined the Air Amateur Opera, Opera Club, uh, uh, Opera Society when I was uh, 18. And that's where I met Barbara, my wife, on stage at uh, the show Carousel in the Getty Theatre in there. So yeah, so I had a, a, a varied, active 
young life. And, and when I was 17 at school, one day I jumped in a bus in Mabel, paid whatever the fare was, went in a bus to Ayr, which is nine miles away. And I found a little address where there was a man called Jimmy Dickey, who I had found and heard was a member of the SNP. And he's the man that signed me up to join the SNP all those years ago. And I've an unbroken membership of 55 years. Excellent, excellent. It's a straight Can I go now, or is, is that it, or <laughs> is there more? <laughs> So you, you must be joking apart. You must be one of the longest serving members of the SNP. Hey, that's a very polite way of saying you're old, Roger. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I know there are people I'm sure who've been in it a lot longer than me. I mean, really? without knowing when he joined, I would guess the famous Jerry Fisher. Well, yeah, yeah. Will have been yeah. in it yeah. uh, a lot longer than me. And yeah. You know, uh, the, the, there are quite a number of others who've been in it longer yeah. than me, but it was good. It was good to be able to say I joined the SNP before the Hamilton by-election. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, not a lot of people can say that. It, may, it must you make you amongst the charm few that can make that claim uh, and substantiate. Yeah, it's been interesting watching the growth of the movement over the years. It certainly has. Yeah, I mean, did you ever imagine? even in your wildest imaginings, that it would have the membership it has now with all these MPs, a Scottish Parliament, way back when you were, what, 17, when you signed up? Yeah. Did you ever imagine that? I mean, to be honest, I never imagined it probably in the way in which it's arrived. That's certainly true. Never imagined the scale of the party. Never imagined the nature of the movement because back in those days, there was only the SNP. There wasn't a wider yes movement or anything equivalent to that. So I, I certainly had no inkling of what was going to happen uh, in years to come. Like everybody else who joined back then, you had a dream of Scottish independence. But it was difficult to see how it was going to achieve. And of course, the debate then about what pathway would lead you towards that was very different. I mean, when I joined, it was very clear the way in which you moved towards independence was you had to elect a majority of MPs to Westminster, yep. who would then, we assumed, negotiate independence, a constitution, something close to your heart, yes. would be created, and that constitution would be put to a referendum of the Scottish people. So when I joined, the pathway towards independence was really quite different to that today. And so it's been interesting to see how things have evolved. So it makes me have sometimes a little sort of rue smile when I hear people saying, this is the way, this is the plan, or that yeah. plan is the plan. Uh, uh, my view partly born of my experience, but partly looking and having been involved in many countries throughout the world, is there is never a the plan. There is a huge variety of ways in which nations have eventually secured their independence. So although it's good to have a, a, a plan that you're going to pursue as your number one choice, uh, in my view, you've always got to have at the back of your mind the flexibility to know that uh, what can happen, as somebody once said, events, dear boy. You never know when events are going to come along that will suddenly change circumstances. Yeah. And also, as, as people also say, a week is a long time in politics. <clears throat> and it, it seems to me what that's sort of suggesting is that you have to be flexible. You have to have exercise the options. Uh, you don't want to be painted into a corner uh, mm. because that just doesn't make any particular sense because unless the other guy paints him or herself in the corner, well, that's fine, that's their lookout. But it, it just strikes me as that it's, it's important to be clear about what you plan to do. I agree with that. So if somebody said to you, 
it would be desirable to just go ahead and have a referendum anyway and, and let the uh, devil take the hindmost. How would you feel about that? Well, uh, if, I, if you'll allow me to take just a wee step back yep. from that question, I think the thing that I would like to see better articulated is what the overall strategy is that informs our pathways to independence. Yep. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, uh, I think there are some underlying principles, some simple principles that we need to articulate to say to the Scottish people, here are the underlying principles that we're never going to depart from, yep. even although there may be some occasions when we need to exercise flexibility. Yep. And these underlying principles, I think, uh, uh, could involve quite a few, but I would stress two in particular. One, we are a democratic movement. It will be through some democratic pathway that is fundamental to our belief. Yep. We're a peaceful, democratic movement. And uh, secondly, we, are, we operate on the principle that the people who are sovereign in our country is not Westminster parliamentarians. It is the Scottish people. Yeah. So I think we need to start articulating what our overall context is. We are peaceful. We are democratic. We believe in the sovereignty of the people and we want to allow anybody to stand in their way of expressing their democratic will. And then what you can do is move in to say, well, is this particular approach, does that meet those criteria and is that the best way to move at current time? But it gives you that wee bit of flexibility. Because as yep. you and I know, John, in different countries, there are different democratic routes. Mm. And, and just as I explained earlier on the SNP in the early days, circumstances were such that it had to be through electing a majority of MPs that would then trigger negotiations. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that has long gone primarily because uh, circumstances have changed and the political expectations of people have changed. And I think most people at the moment would favour having a referendum at which their will was directly expressed, first of all, on the principle of independence. Yeah. So uh, there's that. But I'm, agnostic's the wrong word, I'm relaxed about there being different routes, but a preferred route, if I put it like that. Yeah. So some people in the wider movement, I think what you've got to do is to choose only one pathway and that's the only thing we can do. Sure. It's not the only thing we can do. Yeah. Circumstances change and what we need to be is, we need to be as fleet of foot yeah. as those who are against us. I, th I, think that, I think that's something that a lot of people watching and listening tonight will welcome. Uh, uh, because I think for a lot of people, there, there's a lot of confusion around, uh, i.e. Uh, talking about a Section 30 seems to many people simply surrendering the field to the other side and allowing them to decide uh, if and when they plan to come back and make a response. Uh, I think there's probably a growing number of people who feel, well, there ought to be a time limit on this, i.e. to say, well, we would like a Section 30, but you really have to make up your mind if you agree with us by this time. Otherwise, we move on to Plan B or C or whatever other option is deemed to be. But is that your take on it? Do you think there ought to be a time limit? Uh, I'm perfectly relaxed about a time limit. I certainly think we've got to... I mean, the time limit might not be saying here is a precise date, but it might be saying that we require an answer to this yes. request, and and we and and that's where we could use our parliamentarians in Westminster to require responses to your request once it is put in. the The thing that to me is most appealing about this, I don't believe any process is ever perfect. But the thing to me that, that is appealing about it is if we can force the recognition of a referendum soon through a Section 30 order, 
it just will mean that it cannot be questioned by anybody yeah. in the international community. Yeah. So I see it, I, I see the benefit of it, not so much in terms of Scotland and the rest of the UK, it, but I see it more as a particularly convenient way of opening the door to international recognition. Yeah. It's not the only door, but it would be a particularly convenient one. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that's why Alex Salmond opted for that approach yeah. way back then, because it does, it's a cleaner setup. There's no question about that. I mean, when you go and talk to constitutional experts and you take a look, as you say, at other countries, by far the way, the cleanest way to do it is, is through some arrangement like that, in which the other party agrees to a process. And then there's a higher comfort level. And it means that other nations who feel inhibited about getting involved in that debate because they would see it as internal, then have the freedom uh, to come to a view on something which clearly uh, both parties have agreed is appropriate. I mean, that's abundantly plain. However, and this is a point that so many people raise, we're not dealing with reasonable people here. I mean, anyone who presides over the death of 100,000 of their citizens cannot be, it can be described in lots of ways, but reasonable is not perhaps the first descriptor that comes to mind. And so it's unlikely. And certainly this UPIC committee suggests that it's unlikely that there will be any response from the other side in the foreseeable future. And that was, it's then their interest for any section 30 discussion to be kicked into the long grass uh, through a non-committal response. It's not appropriate. Uh, I'll get back to you when COVID is finished. You know, I can think of a million things. There will always be something very, very urgent that needs the UK government's attention before it can turn to anything constitutional. Yeah. Uh, isn't that a problem then? Doesn't that well, suggest to you that you really have to spend considerable time looking at the alternatives and ranking those and deciding, hey, uh, th this is what we will definitely move on to. So the I other agree. side at least understands yeah. that you're not sitting there, <laughs> you know, just... I know, I know. No, I, I, I agree with you, John. What we've got to do is look at the, the range of scenarios that potentially we would face and really think through properly how we're going to respond, what resources we need to mobilize to respond, yep. and what that might look like. But let me, let me put a fly in the ointment here. Well, I think there are things you can put on the table straight away and let everybody know about. I mentioned earlier, I would favor articulating much more clearly what our principles are around yep. this, it has to be democratic yep. Yep. and so on. But if anybody has ever been in high level negotiations, as anybody knows, you don't go into a negotiation and throw onto the table absolutely everything sure. that's in your plans and, and armory at the outset. Yeah. So there are constraints on us if we want to maximize our influence as to how far we go so that I would be, and unless somebody persuades me otherwise, I'm not persuaded that, let us imagine we had three basic propositions, Section 30 order, right, uh, 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 a referendum called in Rome without a Section 30 order or using an election in some other way. Yeah. So we've got a number of options on the table. If those are our main options, I wouldn't be putting them out in detail at the moment uh, because what you're doing is you're handing all your cards to the other side to decide how yeah. to respond. That, 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 that would just not make an awful lot of sense to me. On the other hand, the problem with that is, and it is a very real problem, is that the people who are going to do the hard work to win independence are going to be the tens of thousands of people on the ground who have got to do the hard slog, yep. knocking the doors, even if it's virtually all that work uh, to do it. Yep. And they need to be in the tent. Yeah. So... We want, I would want people to know as much as is possible, but we need to have some flexibility 
and we've got to be careful not to show our full hand and all our negotiation assets up front to those that we'll be negotiating with. So it, it, there are a lot of fine judgments to be made and uh, a lot of debates to be had. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I, I think it would be foolish to, to reveal in detail what one plans to do. That makes no sense, as you say, in a negotiating uh, context. But it, it does seem to me to be essential to keep folks on board Absolutely. Uh, and I raised this same point with Ian Blackford some time ago when we were talking about wargaming. And he pointed out that Westminster had already wargamed this, 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 uh, this uh, independence. And I said, has the SNP done so? And he said, yes. I, I would hope that, and I accept the point about you, you don't want to talk about so much about the detail, but it ought to be possible to talk about the principle i.e., uh, you know, we're going to give this approach this length of time, for example, uh, without necessarily being hugely specific, but just to make it plain, this is not an unlimited offer. We've put this on the table because we think it's the most desirable approach, but it's not going to be there forever. Oh, I, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, my personal prejudice would be, uh, let us assume that there's an SNP government following May's parliamentary election. My assumption is we would, we would want to force a detailed response from the UK government within a matter of weeks and months, not a year or anything like that. And uh, 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 so we have to have things well planned and thought through uh, very quickly. I would well, like to see the result of Ian's war gaming, but, yeah. but uh, uh, <laughs> I can well understand uh, uh, that type of thing is best held within some degree of uh, uh, secrecy, if you like, uncomfortable sure. though I am with that, because you've just got to be careful about these things. But we, we've also, I mean, one thing that I've written about recently too, is we've got to understand that we are, in, we are in a world that for a whole host of pressures is changing faster than ever before. Yeah. That in itself is creating in many spheres of life far greater uncertainty than ever before. Yeah. Some people might describe that as risk, right? And therefore we, we need to thoroughly take account of this changing context, we, we, are, we have to have strategies that are flexible enough to respond to changes that come our way. That's yeah. why, for example, in economics, I, I, I would favour, and I'm very sad that what has been lost from many of our economic curricula is what was really created in Scotland, and that was the tradition of political economy yeah. that really started in a big way with Adam Smith it covered the likes of Karl Marx and all the rest of it, where they recognised that what you've got to take account in the functioning of something like an economy is not just economics as we understand it today. It has to be understood in terms of the political context that people are yep. operating in. It has yep. to be understood in terms of the law and the like. Yep. So I think there's too narrow a focus and we need to get back to broadening out to the, the richness of how society operates, and then it's easier for you to understand and cope with the uncertainty that's faced today. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you where I'm coming from on this, and I wanted, I would love to hear how, what you think of this. I, I think you're gonna have my pick, large gin. Uh, go right ahead, it looks like, more like vodka from here, but uh, <laughs> good, good health to you, uh, Slanjava. The, um, uh, the, I, 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 I feel the independence movement, more particularly the SNP, missed their trick. The Growth Commission, and I've spoken to Andrew Wilson about this, and he accepts this point, it was the wrong way around. In other words, we started talking about growth before we decided what we wanted to do with the growth. In other words, we did not say, here are our principles, this is what we stand for, this is what we will not stand for. Uh, you can call it a constitution, you can describe it as some sort of contract with the Scottish people and the rest of the world. We didn't do that. 
what we did was we rushed straight into this is how we're going to handle growth. And I thought, well, you know, and I said to him, you know, surely it would have been smarter to have talked about, that's a bit like saying, this is how we're going to build the bathroom, but we haven't laid the foundations. It may be a great bathroom, but how does it all fit together? And how do you make decisions about what sort of growth is desirable? You can't do any of these things unless you've already established firmly and have, it, have those agreed principles in place. And he said, well, that, that, you're right, but that wasn't my job. <laughs> so I was asked to talk about growth, and I talked about growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but well, it still begs the question, why talk about growth before you've decided what you want the growth to do? And it seems to be entirely the wrong way around. Yeah, uh, well, I would agree. I would perhaps put it slightly differently from you. Uh, as you may know, I was one of those that was on the Growth Commission. And what I focused on from the outset was I said, I, I wasn't involved in the technicalities about currency or anything else. Other people dealt with that. And in any case, it wasn't what I was most interested in. What I was most interested in is what kind of country do we want to be? And what are the building blocks that will help get us there? Exactly. And so that one of the things I did at a very early stage was I sent Andrew a note and said, and this was when I was still an MP at the time, I said, I had a recent discussion with a member of the Treasury, a civil service in the UK Treasury, uh, who agreed to have a meeting with me. And basically, I've always been concerned about the tax system and other elements of society and what people's contribution towards growth is yeah there are basically two things I would say from or, or three things from that one is we know our demography is changing such that the population is getting older and older yeah and the working age population is shrinking yeah. that in itself presents a challenge and recognizing that future con- current and future context I wanted to be able to say something about it so I got all the information I could and how people come into the country, Uh, different sorts of visas, not standard visas, but there are visas for entrepreneurs, for investors and the like. And Andrew was quite happy that I wrote up bits and saying, how would we go to make Scotland the most talent friendly country in the world? Because I think that's what I would want to see of Scotland in the future. But it was like saying, what do I want to see of Scotland? And then how is, the demographic question is going to be answered in the yeah. light of that. And in terms of taxation, for example, when I was talking to the guy in the Treasury, it was readily admitted that the UK has one of the most complicated and expensive tax systems to run. Yeah. And it's also hugely inefficient. Yeah. Right? There's, be, there's somewhere between 36 billion and 70 billion pounds every year uncollected and tax because it's too difficult. Yeah. And when I explored with this guy why he, he thought that was, he said, well, he says, I think the major problem is a, something that I've been asked to answer by the Treasury itself. He says, I'm currently doing a project which is to try and find out where all the loopholes are. Right? So far, I've identified 1,100 oh. in the tax system. Yeah. Nobody, as he said, nobody, not even your fanciest big accountancy firms, nobody knows everything about the UK tax system. It, it, it's so complicated and so open, so, so many loopholes. And of course, being so complicated, it's expensive. So it's roughly... It costs per head of population roughly twice the cost of Denmark's to run our tax system, and it's far less efficient than being able to draw funds in. Yeah. Now, to me, these are some of the, if, if you like, parts of the foundation, as you put it. Yeah. Parts of the foundation we need to be able to answer and fix. Yeah. So I would agree with you. And some of the other questions that people are getting assessed about I don't think it is important as getting some of these fundamentals done and be clear about what is the direction we are wanting to take our country in. Well, that, that seems to me to be hugely important 
because that's presumably what a referendum will focus on. It will be central to that. I, I mean, I, I talked recently to Professor Murray Pittock on the show, yeah. and he talked very eloquently about horizon, you know, looking to the horizon, which is a large, large, some, in many senses, exactly what you've been saying. You know, let's, let's look ahead, let's establish what sort of country we want to create, and that will tell us how we want to uh, create it. So you, you, have the, you have the vision, first of all, and then you have the values, and then you put the mechanics in place that matches yeah. the values to the vision. We haven't done that. I, 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 I've got every sympathy. I agree with each other. And it was interesting you mentioned uh, uh, Murray Pittock and his view about the horizon and looking towards the future. You know, I've spent a lot of my life involved in one way or another in higher and further education, helping in different ways, right? Uh, and one of the things that I think we need to do is we need to move away from Scotland benchmarking itself against the other countries in the UK, which we tend to do and often follow the fashions that are set elsewhere. If we truly want to, as Winnie Ewing said many years ago, stop the world I want to get on, what we should be doing is we should be benchmarking ourselves against the best small and medium sized countries in the world. And we should be pursuing excellence in what we're doing, not settling for, if, in the education and training jargon, not settling for mere competence. We, yeah. should be, we should be settling for only the best for our people and the best for our nation in terms of playing a constructive and competitive role in the world. So I think we need in that regard to be much more ambitious than we have been. And I think that's where I, I, I like what you were saying, Murray was saying about, you know, looking at horizon uh, uh, and looking at what, what's the kind of future we are trying to construct here. Can we do things better? Absolutely. Can we do them within the UK? Absolutely not. Because the UK is one of the most inward looking countries and you only need to listen to Boris Johnson and the like continually talking. It's all about British, at times I would even say English, exceptionalism. We are special. We don't need to really learn from others. Yeah. And we've suffered from that over the years. Whereas I think what Scotland needs to be is more outward looking, yeah. more ambitious. You're never going to achieve absolute excellence, but that's where you should be aiming. Yeah, very good point. I'd like to take some questions now because they're coming in, I have to say, thick and fast. I think you may have addressed a number of them, but uh, let, me, let me just put them anyway, because I like to feel that people feel their questions have been put. Jim McIntyre, his question is, is the 11 point plan just an excuse for the leadership to procrastinate? <laughs> hey, well, you'd have to ask the leadership that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, he's that, he's that obviously asking for your view on that. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just being cheeky, Jim, while I try and gather my thoughts so that I don't land myself in trouble. You know, no, I don't. I mean, to be fair, I don't think it is. I mean, I've known, for example, Mike Russell for I don't know how long, yeah. an awful lot of years since we were both at university, right? Yeah. And I'm absolutely sure that Mike is as committed to independence and as desirous to achieve it as quickly as possible as I am. Yeah. I mean, if you were saying is, do I think it is the only way that we need to be prepared to move forward? I think we've already discussed that, John. Yeah, yeah we have. You know, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. Yeah. But do I think this is, an, this is a, 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 an egg that should be put in the basket, I would say, absolutely, yes. Okay, okay. But it shouldn't oh. be the only way in which we reason about this future. Good point. What we'll do then is we'll ask Mike Russell to come on the show and he can, exp he can expound on that point. Uh, if yeah. you're talking to, to Mike, uh, you might like to mention that we'd love to have I'll, him on I'll, the show. I, I, I will make every endeavour as this show continues to drop him in it as often as possible. <laughs> Uh, he will probably reciprocate when he, <laughs> hopefully when he appears. Katrina McDonald is asking, 
What does Roger think about the Craig Murray court case and the information that's, uh, that has emerged? Is that the likes of uh, stuff which I believe is coming out today? I, I don't know what came out today. I'm, I'm not up to speed with that. Well, my understanding, question. my understanding is what has come out today is a lengthy blog based on his affidavit to the court. But, uh, uh, but I've not read it, all. so okay. I, I, I've got difficulty in that regard in commenting in detail as to what is uh, happening yeah. uh, uh, in that regard. What I would say, however, is that I think like the vast majority of people in the movement, I feel desperately sad that we've got into this situation. I feel desperately sad for the individuals involved. I feel desperately sad for the cause. And I think what we have got to do is, for those of us who are not close to the action, right, what we've got to do is we have got to keep our eyes on the big prize of independence and make sure we do everything we can uh, uh, to make sure that although there might be some very choppy waters ahead because of that, we need to meet, make sure that this ship of ours stays afloat and that we're going in the right direction. And I'm perfectly sure that the uh, movement can do that, but I think like most people, I just at times shake my head and uh, uh, I'm concerned about the short term future and I'm concerned yeah. about a lot of the individuals, yeah. who, uh, uh, some of whom have been long-standing friends of mine. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for that. Um, I would make two comments before we move on. Uh, uh, one is, I would, I would agree with you to, to a large degree. I also feel that while it's important to be open and transparent, uh, I'm not sure there's a huge interest in the subject outside of the, the independence community. I'm not sure it gets much traction amongst folks who are not involved in politics in any way, shape or form. Um, well, it was, in, it was interesting you see, you see that, John, because, uh, which day of the week is this? This is when, Wednesday. When, Wednesday. I think it was, it was the last Friday, I was asked to take part in a call, right? involving people from the financial community in London and in New York. And I was asked to be on there to have a discussion with this call for about 40 minutes, I was told, with people in senior positions interested in Scottish independence. And I was told, and they follow it closely, right? Well, I would say, if they follow it closely, the issue that has been raised never featured, nobody commented on it. Yeah. Nobody raised it. Yeah. What they were much more interested in was actually uh, something that you've raised here. They were much more interested in what is this future that you're trying to create? Yes. And why is this pathway to independence the way in which you're going to create it? So I found an audience that maybe thought I was a bit strange, maybe thought people in our, our movement, they didn't quite fully get it. But they were more interested in the cause, as it were, yeah. than in any of the personalities. Yeah. You know, I've been in the SNP, as we talked earlier, a good while, and I think it's, in my time, I think there's been six leaders of the party yeah. in that time. Uh, I have always thought from the very early days, from the very early days as a young man, I always thought there's a danger in being too caught up in the personalities that are involved. Yeah. Right? Because people are fleeting. Right? What is not, what, the one thing that's going to remain consistent is the cause. Yeah. So I've always tried, I've not always succeeded, but I've always tried to make sure that my prime focus is on the cause. Yeah. And I think that's what we need at the moment more than anything else. Yeah, and I think there's probably a bit of a vacuum there which needs to be filled. Uh, yeah. but I like, think we're talking too much to ourselves. That's my point. Rather than talking about the big questions we need to address. Exactly. 
and I'll make a suggestion, and I repeat it in the, my column on Sunday in the Sunday National. Maybe one of the reasons that the folks in New York were not terribly interested in these matters, even though they seem and are important in the context that they're in, they don't have that traction outside. Yeah. And I, I'm suggesting a reason, and that is Americans are well used to uh, the difficulties in uh, so-called secessionist movements because they invest in countries where this is common, if not uh, universal, but common perhaps. And also their own experience, you know, where the, the people who brought about independence in the United States were not a happy throng. It, it wasn't some sort of... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't some sort of mutual admiration society. These people fought like cats in a sack. Absolutely. And even once they got an independence, you had this extraordinary situation where Alexander Hamilton fought a duel with the vice president because he couldn't thaw the guy. Uh, so it wasn't just a question of, you know, principles and practice. It was, it was personal animus uh, writ large. Well, uh, uh, and, and, absolutely. And, and, and this is what happens. And if you want to bring about major constitutional change, the notion that you can do this in a very sort of, uh, uh, sort, of uh, uh, sort of straightforward way is fanciful, you know, because, and, and I think particularly when it comes to the SNP, because it's a very broad church, you know, there's no right-wing secessionist movement in Scotland. Yeah. The weirdest thing you, you could ever imagine in many respects. But in, in, and in my view, that's been its great strength. Even when we were a much smaller party, we were always a broad church. Yeah. And I think that's a great, a great strength. I, 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 I'm not somebody who believes in moral certainty or ideological certainty. Yeah. So I don't have that curious approach. I have got friends in this movement, good friends over many years, who in comparison with myself would be to the left, would be to the centre and would be to the right of me. And I want them to remain my friends. We get different views on things, but what we share is a complete desire to get to independence as quickly as possible and to make sure that we create a future that all of us can be proud of. Yeah. Well, that, that comment you've just made is echoed by a comment from David McCann, who says that, look, he says, I joined the SNP in 1969. And I feel we're now in the end game. So a few months getting it right is more important than getting it right now. I, I couldn't agree more, David. My, my question to David was, why did he leave it so late to join? But, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but I agree entirely with David's sentiments. Yeah. Uh, Tom Arthur, uh, sorry, Tom MacArthur is asking, should I support SNP 1 and 2 in the vote in May, or should I split it with an indie party uh, to remove uh, unionists? Well, my answer to this is a very pragmatic one uh, from talking as I have done uh, uh, because another part of my life has been in academia, including in political science, just looking at what, uh, what for example, sophologists would say. Uh, some of the other parties that are being talked about don't register in the Richter scale when you do polls. They are nowhere near being able to take a seat uh, as things stand at the moment, and we've only a few weeks to go. Yeah. The, the relative failure in the last Scottish Parliament elections compared with the previous one when we did get an outright majority was because our second vote was weaker. It wasn't close enough to our first vote. Yeah. So I'm voting one and two. I understand why people, I mean, I don't condemn people who take a different view. I can understand what they think they have a better chance of achieving, which is a majority for independence in the Scottish Parliament by going another route. So I think it's a perfectly legitimate debate to have. But my understanding of where the numbers are and what the prospects are and what the time scale is, from my point of view, I'm going to be voting one and two SNP because I think it's the best way of trying to secure a majority for independence yeah. in the next parliament. 
Well, the, the, see, that, that, this is now an example. I, I take your point, and uh, we've already interviewed way back when the leader of the ISP. So, I mean, if they want to come back and talk about that, then that's that's uh, that's okay. Uh, I think I think my um, it, this leads me to a, a, an issue which I think again it bears upon what we were talking about earlier. I would have expected somebody somewhere, either in the SNP or the, the, the broader movement, to have, to have put together a package, a, a, an information package uh, that, that helped people understand this uh, as well as possible. Uh, it seems to me that what people often complain about is that there's conflicting information. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons the question has been raised. It seems to me this is uh, straightforward, not to be terribly complicated. Uh, and we also ought to address the fact that, while well, I find the behaviour of some of the opposition MSPs reprehensible, nonetheless, the system appears to be relatively fair in making sure that the so-called minor parties are properly represented. And you, would, you could, if you step back from the whole thing, say, well, that's a good thing, surely. Yeah, you know, yes, the fact I mean, that there's an opposition, okay, uh, right now, because of the nature of the opposition, perhaps, they haven't put their best people there. But that was a choice that they made. It doesn't mean the system is flawed, necessarily. Yeah, I mean, there are two things I would want to say in response to that, John. If I take your first point about surely there should be better information. Uh, in the last couple of weeks or there, thereabouts, within the SNP, through the person who was elected to head up organisational matters, uh, uh, there, there is a roadshow going now, talking about the vote, talking about the two votes, and that is going around the country. And as far as I can tell from the people who've contacted me about it, uh, uh, and people in my own region, it's gone down very well. People have found it very informative, right? And they found the arguments reasonable, right? And so that I'm glad that's so, out. Be perfectly reasonable to say we've known this election was coming for a few years, it should yeah. have been out before now. But yeah. you know, I'm glad that there is something now that's out. And, okay. uh, uh, let me so, just ask so you a quick question. The, the other point I just want to reflect on is the consequences of the voting system. Uh, uh, I've been uh, committed to PR, I would prefer a different type of PR, mm. but I, uh, uh, I've been committed to it. And, uh, for a long, long time and have no reason to change my view. We do have a very poor opposition. Yeah. Right? Uh, and this may seem very strange, but I regret that. Yeah. Because that in itself has impoverished the quality exactly. of debate in Parliament. And it has coloured the whole notion of... And it, 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 it actually doesn't serve our cause well. I would agree with that. You know, if you're standing up in a debate and all you're met with is completely insane comments and stupid yeah. questions, yeah. it doesn't give you a platform yeah. to properly articulate responses. Yeah. So uh, uh, I would, uh, I actually think it would be helpful for the cause if uh, uh, we at least had one or two of the smaller opposition parties a bit more on the ball than they are. Yeah. 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 But then again, that's their decision. They chose to put up uh, um, the, the people of the quality or the lack of quality in the people they chose. Maybe that would change as we get closer to... Well, I think you see the consequences of that because I've never lived in a period when there has been more abuse thrown around. Exactly. You know, that anybody raises an issue and, and suddenly, and this includes actually within the SNP and, you know, within the wider yeah. movement as well. Far too often people are taking quick sides. Oh, you say that, therefore, yeah. I am going to tell you what your motive is. And it's always a bad one because see yeah. me, I'm the good guy. Yeah. Now, this kind of moral superiority that leads people into ad hominem attacks on others rather than in a more rational way discussing policies. Yeah. That is to no one's benefit, and I've got little yeah. time for it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair point. Now, I'm going to embarrass you now. Mm -hmm. So you've had a health warning. Here it comes. Uh, Melanie McCain said, uh, where does he teach? And, uh, and what does he do? I'd love him to be my professor. Ah, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> Could I say that I agree, I agree entirely with that comment? <laughs> And, I, uh, and uh, uh, I should supply an address so that you can send an envelope, a brown envelope with large dosh of money in it. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what I do. Uh, right. Uh, I've taught at different universities. The ones that I've taught most at have been many years ago, for a few years, uh, as a, when I was doing research, I tutored at Edinburgh University. Uh, I, tut I tutored and was on some course teams at the Open University for over 20 years, again, yep. or, uh, all part-time, and I've taught at Stirling University for I don't know how long, 12, 15 years, and for about nine or 10 of those years, uh, I've been an honorary professor. Well, what do I teach? Uh, the thing that I'm particularly interested in is judgment and decision-making. And that's why you mentioned earlier, some of the work that I've done for the World Bank in different countries has been facilitating groups having to make very difficult policy decisions, something I'm interested in. So I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in, uh, in teaching in politics, but in the context of what's called the political environment. In other words, not looking at it in terms of party competition, Yeah but looking at it in terms of how does the body politics influence things, whether it's business, the economy, and, and, and whatever. So I'm interested in that. And I'm also very interested in organisation change, culture change. How do you change cultures in organisations? The other thing is that, uh, although I no longer chair this committee, I did for a number of years at Stirling chair a committee that had a very, very long name. I think it was something that like the Joint Departmental research ethics committee, something like that. In other words, what, and what I used to do, what my little committee did, which sometimes felt like a committee of one, I used to do an ethical review of research proposals by the academics oh. to make sure they were compliant with good practice and people's rights and the like. So I've had quite a lot of interest in a lot of things, or as some people would probably accurately put it, I'm not really very good at anything, so I have to do a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that will put off your fan club. It's obvious in these <laughs> remarks that that won't do it. Two, two quick questions. We, we, we're getting close. To, we've only got eight minutes to go. Uh, I should have warned you that this hour will go very quickly. <laughs> it has. It just goes in a flash. Two, two quick questions. One is, why, how does a roadshow work when there's a COVID, when there's a pandemic? Well, you do it without a road. Traffic. How does it work? <laughs> <laughs> it's all done virtually. No, so well, in that case, for why doesn't it just, why does it have to be specific to specific areas? Why don't you just put it up and broadcast it? Well, uh, uh, oh, that's actually a very good question. But it's for the SNP, right? It's for SNP members. So what, what has been happening so far, this is my understanding, I've not been involved in this, but my yeah. understanding is so far it's been taken around to the different regions, the eight regions for yeah. regional seats, because it's primarily about the first and second vote principles. But there are recordings of it, so there are, if there are people here who are in the SNP, they can go in through their membership to a bit called My SNP. Okay. Wait, wait, to be honest, I find it a bit <laughs> difficult sometimes to find things, but in there somewhere, okay. there are links to these presentations. Okay. So if you're from like me, Mid Scotland and Fife, you can click on and get the link to see the presentation about okay. Mid Scotland and Fife. Okay, okay. Um, I'd like to come back to that if I may, but I want to fit this question in very quickly if we can. Uh, Mary Malloy is asking, what does Roger think of the Martin Keating's court case? Hey, what do I think of it? I've not really been, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously interested. Uh, I've not been closely involved in it. I'm always a wee bit wary of going at an early stage towards the law. Now, I say that as somebody who's not a lawyer, of course. One of the many things I don't know too much about. But I'm a bit reluctant. Uh, uh, I, and I was surprised it was being taken forward when it was. 
uh, because I'm always uncertain about what the results are going to be of a, a legal ru ruling that might set a straitjacket on you mm -hmm. before you have really pursued politically matters. Because to me, although legal questions will always arise, for me, the cause of independence in any nation is always quite properly led by politics and people's beliefs, not by uh, legal systems. So uh, I'm interested in it. I've not become involved in it. And I think the sensible thing is to focus on the political challenges we face at the moment. But obviously interested to see what the ruling uh, eventually is. Well, it, it'll be transformational if, it, if Lady Carmichael delivers and it's further endorsed by other, other judges that uh, if she comes to the view that it's perfectly uh, legit, lawful for the uh, Scottish Parliament to, to decide on a referendum, that would be a game changer. Uh, now you're right, she could equally come down the other side and say, no, I, I don't think it would be lawful. And, and my understanding, I mean, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, you may be paying more attention to this than myself, John, but uh, 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 it's not inconceivable that a ruling is made that then subject to appeal. Exactly. And so That's it drags really on and on and on until yeah. it eventually gets to the Supreme Court. So it could be something that drags on and on and on. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not the best person to comment on it. You would need a QC or something yeah. like that to be more informed. Okay. Okay. Well, Ma Martin's pretty savvy and we might well invite him back to talk some more about it. Maybe once Lady Carmichael has, has offered, uh, handed down her initial view, I suppose. Yeah. Um, one question we received earlier was if, if it's actually from uh, Monica and Monica wrote to me a couple of days ago saying, Monica Worley at Aberfeldy saying, could you please ask Roger if he, if he would start sending out reports from NEC meetings uh, to constituents now that it's allowed un unless specifically restricted, others are doing this and it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, certainly, what, what I mean, when I got uh, uh, notified, I think it was about 11 o'clock one night that I had won a seat in the NEC at some point in early December. By three o'clock in the morning, I was, <laughs> I was having a communication right, uh, by phone, by text, with the second person elected for Mid Scotland in Fife, and that was Alison Graham. And I had already looked at the Constitution, and there are things in the Constitution called regional steering committees that members of the NEC, such as herself, are supposed to chair. In a lot of regions, they've never been held, but they're there. So one of the first things we did was we called an informal meeting of the regional group. And uh, last week, we had the first formal meeting, so we've already had two meetings of that. Mm -hmm. It is now the case that under my SNP, uh, you will see that NEC decisions from NEC meetings are now open and recorded. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite possible in meetings uh, for members of the NEC to appropriately discuss what's happening in the NEC with members. Yeah. Obviously, you want to be very careful that you're not uh, putting things out into a wider context that would be uh, helpful to those who are against us. Yeah. So that I've already been invited to, I mean, I don't think I've turned down a single invite from any branch to go along and talk to them. So I've had a couple of regional steering committee meetings talking about this, and I've had a good half a dozen meetings with branches throughout the region. And so uh, anybody that's part of a branch that wants me to come and talk along in more detail about the NEC, just get in touch, happy to do so. She's actually asking a slightly broader question. She said, uh, send out reports from NEC meetings to constituents. Is that the practice? She says others are doing this. To constituents? Yeah, maybe she means uh, members. Um, uh, I, I mean, I don't think it would be appropriate to send things out to the wider public. Right, okay. Um, this because of some of the areas that 
uh, have a responsibility for it, but it's certainly appropriate to talk about in brief members. Okay. And much okay. more so than was done in the past. Right. And, and people can contact you to do that. And they can contact me, yeah. Excellent, super. Roger, it's been great. The 60 minutes has flown. <laughs> we only, we've only scratched the surface. Uh, and one of the questions I wanted to ask, but we've run out of time, was about the pleb our plebiscite election. But maybe we can, we can maybe do that offline and get back to people. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching tonight. Uh, it's, it's and a big thank you to, to uh, Roger, obviously. Uh, we've got some great guests again coming up on the TNT show. Uh, we're back next week with Marsha Scott of Women for Independence. You don't want to miss that. Uh, and look out for the Constitution column that I talked about earlier, because I'll be dealing with UPIC and, uh, and why the Tories are exercising the old management motto, which is the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> uh, and very importantly, please support Indie Live. Go to Indie Live What's On Guide at www.whatsonguide.scot. You'll find all the information about the TNT show, about many other great shows. Uh, it, it's an absolute goldmine of information. And please, again, think about joining us next week to speak with Marsha. A big thank you to Roger. A big thank you to all of you. And remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Good night all, take care. <laughs>